G'day ladies and gents, Cubic Meter here. It is that time of the year again, and here on the Wavetech server, we have a Christmas tradition of a Secret Santa event where we each get assigned a member and prepare a gift customized for that person. And this year we have Zoid, an expert at slimestone and practical flying machines. His skills really came into their element during Sipover's one block event but he designed flying machines to help with the construction of Minecraft's ultimate military base. Details on that feat, we'll have to wait for Sipover's video about the event, but one thing Zoid is quite fond of is well-designed mini-games. And one of his favourite games is the infamous Missile Wars, a game mode where players fight with flying machine missiles and try to blow each other up. Unfortunately, we can't exactly build this on the server. Missile Wars is way too complicated with too many items and abilities that will be hard to replicate in vanilla survival. So, keeping with the theme of Missile Wars, I thought I might try to build Battleship with real projectiles to give an element of spectacle to the game. We already have the technology to do this. The smart artillery can precisely launch anvils at a grid, and detection of a hit can be done automatically by breaking the anvil and collecting the item with a hopper. And thus already we get the idea that it may be possible to build a fully autonomous game of Battleship in Vanilla Survival. Before we get started, let's have a look at the actual rules for the game Battleship. Each player gets a fleet of ships of various sizes, and they have to arrange these ships in a 10x10 grid. The players then take turns taking shots, and the game gives them feedback on what they hit. Immediately we get the sense that this game has a lot of room for flexibility in the design, allowing us to make things as simple or as complex as needed to strike a balance of utility, form and function. What I'm imagining is that each player will have a grid, and on this grid they'll be able to define squares to be the various ships, and then the opponent will launch anvils over the barrier separating the player's spaces and if the anvil scores a hit this hit needs to be reflected on some board that faces the opponent. We can design a tile as a component which the player can hit a button which toggles it into a separate state which indicates that the tile has been defined as a component of a ship. Then if an anvil lands on this tile the item can be collected by hoppers underneath, and that is how we determine when a tile is hit. The tile can then change states to indicate that it's been hit. With a little bit of ingenuity, the solution can be much easier than you think. We really only need to communicate two states to the player. If something is not a ship, then it's underwater. However, if something is a ship, then it's out of water. And when you sink part of the ship, it returns to the water. This would have to be the simplest and most compact solution to our problem. We could try to go for something much more complicated with fancy block swappers to change out the colours. However, this would make it way more complicated and it would probably be very difficult to fit this into a tiled system. And when you start to tile it into the full 10x10 grid, you start to understand why compactness is such an imperative. The next step is to make sure that we send feedback to the opponent. So when they hit or miss a target in the enemy's grid, this needs to be reflected in a vertical grid which can either display a miss or a hit. After missing around a bit, I've settled on this tileable mechanism. So from the front, you can see there is a white concrete in the middle. However, because it's surrounded on all four sides by blocks, the light engine shades it much darker. We go ahead and trigger this input. The white concrete gets pushed out and will suddenly become a lot brighter. Something that's also extremely important with a machine like this is a reset mechanism that can fully reset the display no matter what state it's in. So right there, we just reset back to the default. We can also define a hit which makes it switch to a yellow concrete and push that out. And this state can also be reset. We can also fill it around with it and put it in all sorts of states. Like for example, if we hit the reset while it's in the default state, it will go back to the default state. If we hit the yellow, there we go. Hit it again, nothing happens. 
If for some reason it finds itself like this, hit the reset. Goes back to the start. Just having a mechanism that can be reset no matter what state it's in makes things a lot easier to fix if something goes wrong. After wiring everything together, we have the battle grid connected to the display. And you'll notice that the display is facing away from the grid. And that is because, from the perspective of this display, you want feedback from your opponent's grid. An annoying consequence of this is that in order to make the full game, the wiring for the displays has to overlap in the middle, meaning a little bit of trickery is required to get all the signals to where they need to go. If I unpower the lever and then power it again, you'll see the display on the opposite side is fully reset. While this circuit is powered, we can also go through and define the tiles where our battleships will be. In order to start playing, we'll want to go ahead and unpower this. Now let's imagine that we're playing the game and I fire a shot and it misses. This will be reflected on the opposite board as a miss. If we fire another shot and this time it hits the target, we obtain a hit. If we power the lever back on, we'll then reset the board and we're ready to start another game. Can we also just take a moment to appreciate the wiring for this game? I mean, it doesn't get cleaner than that, right? So because we just have a 10x10 10 10 grid, it's easy enough to simply take a row and column output and feed it directly into the display. Conversion from the horizontal to the vertical is as simple as using these bubble columns. This mechanism is simply a dispenser with a bucket and when it flips state by either dispensing the bucket or sucking out the water, the bubble column will switch from being a bubble column to just being bog standard water and we can actually detect this further up the column using observers. And the best part is that the signal transmits instantly through the entire column. And taking a look at these rails, you can clearly see how we break out each row into one of these rails and then the rails translate into the bubble columns which then separate back out into the rows of the board. And each one of the columns will send one of two signals to indicate the two different states that our tiles can be in. If the shot is a hit, we power the rail on the left. And if the shot is a miss, we power the rail on the right. These signals are then separated out in the wall display to give us either the hit or the marker for the miss. So that is the easy part done. Now the hard part is to get anvils flying through the air at precise trajectories. Fortunately we already have a potential solution to this problem in the form of the smart artillery. And thanks to the development of the UCSM mod by KKG, we can automatically get the settings of the cannon for a particular coordinate. So for this particular coordinate we want to input 35, 45, and now this anvil should be launched directly at a target that we chose. There it goes, and it's going to land on that target right there. And you might be thinking, well, that was easy, you already have a working cannon. But we won't be using this cannon. Instead, we'll be using this new and improved anvil artillery with encoded variable TNT dupers as well as these precision timers that can automatically reset. So if I go ahead and hit this note block, we'll arm the cannon and fire an anvil right out of the freaking stratosphere. So while we already have a working cannon as well as a mod that can automatically give us the controls for the cannon, unfortunately because this is a new design and the connection between coordinates and fire settings are specific to each cannon design, we don't know the specific fire control settings for this new cannon. Which means we'll have to go through the process of characterizing the fire control dynamics of this new design. If we use selective rendering to look inside of the machine, you can see that what we have is two rows of TNT, and we can actually vary the amount of TNT that gets duped in these lecterns. If we go ahead and drop the tick rate like so, and then trigger it, we can have a look and watch as the TNT gets aligned. 
it will then start moving in these water streams and we can actually vary the distance that the TNT moves using these precision timers at the back. At some point some powdered snow as well as water gets dispensed and that will stop the TNT from moving at a specific time. This means that by combining the amount of TNT duped with the final position of that TNT with these timers, we essentially get all degrees of freedom multiplied by the amount of items in these hopper carts as well as the amount of combinations of TNT. This means if we give the cannon a fixed position relative to the battleship game, we can almost guarantee that there will be a fire setting to hit each one of these tiles. Oh, and that's something I didn't consider. The game has a two box sensor, but the cannon has a one box sensor. That is a problem because adding a single block of separation here is going to cause the grid to lo no longer be square. And as for the cannon, well, it has to be a one block center because there can only be one anvil. Look, we aren't exactly builders here, so let's just pretend that issue doesn't exist. So how does one characterize the firing dynamics of the smart artillery? Well, here I have it set up in a creative test world with command blocks coming out of it like medical probes on a test subject. For example, these two command blocks will log the position as well as the motion of the anvil projectile with respect to time. So when I go ahead and fire the cannon, it'll trigger the command blocks for a moment. And in my game's console, I can see the coordinates of the anvil entity printed out to me every single tick. So here are the starting coordinates of the anvil, and here is the starting velocity of the anvil, which is obviously zero. But then we roll over to the next tick, where the position of the anvil has changed because it starts falling. The motion has also increased in the negative y direction because it's falling due to gravity. Then in the tick after that, the TNT has exploded and now our anvil is flying through the air at high speed. This lets me characterize the exact position and initial velocity of the anvil at the moment when the TNT explodes. I can then punch this position and velocity into a model of the cannon to try and simulate every single configuration of the cannon and where the anvil will land as a result. That is all the information we need about our projectile for now, so I'm just going to go ahead and instantly kill the anvil whenever the cannon goes to fire. Now that we know where the anvil is when the TNT explodes, we need to characterize the position of the TNT with respect to the anvil, which is controlled by the item count in this hopper minecart. You actually might recognize this precision timer from the Orbital Strike Cannon 2.0. The beauty about this design is that it can self-reset automatically. Which means all I need to do is jerry-rig the cannon to automatically cycle through every single setting. And the way that I have done this is by moving all of the items out of this hopper minecart into this hopper right here. So each time the cannon fires, this hopper will add an item to the timer, meaning that eventually we'll cycle through every single setting and have it printed out on this command block. So I've just gone ahead and cranked up the tick rate, so let's start the cannon. And there we go! It's cycling through every single setting, and if we have a look at this hopper minecart, there we go. The item count is accumulating with each cycle. And once the cannon's done, the exact position of the TNT has been printed out for every single one of those timer settings. All of these positions can then be thrown into our computer model, which simulates over 400,000 ballistic trajectories for up to 600 ticks along each trajectory to obtain a total of 2.6 billion points. We then sort through the points for the highest trajectories and trim the set down to about 110 million points which we can assemble into the point cloud which can be visualized right here. Taking a close look at our point cloud and we can clearly see that we obtained ranges of up to 400 blocks away from the cannon 
as well as a spread of around 200 blocks. Alright, now that we have our point cloud loaded and set, let's try hitting some actual targets. We want to start by setting the origin of the cannon, which I've set to be this anvil. Now we can go to a target, do the command, give us the settings to fire at this target. There we go. So we want to do 40, 3, 5, and 10. There we go. Now if we fire. Oh, that's not right. Let's try shooting at this target, which is 58.4338 instead. Settings loaded up. Arm the cannon. And away goes the anvil in completely the wrong direction. Needless to say, there is definitely something wrong with the cannon. Oh my freaking god, I have just figured it out. Here is a really simple demonstration of what happens when you accelerate something with TNT. Normally when TNT explodes, it will propel entities away from the explosion, which seems like perfectly reasonable behavior. If we do it with TNT accelerating other TNT, you can clearly see the TNT gets accelerated away. Something that is pretty obvious is that if you stick a block in the way, it no longer receives knockback from the explosion. And whether or not the knockback is blocked is entirely dependent on the collisions that a block has. So for example, with these fence gates closed, you can see no momentum is transferred. However, if I open the fence gates, momentum can suddenly pass through. So for a block of no collision such as powdered snow, it's perfectly reasonable that the knockback will pass through and be transmitted to entities on the other side. However, for some stupid reason, this specifically doesn't work for falling block entities. For literally any other entities such as other TNT or iron golems, the knockback can be transmitted through powdered snow. But specifically for falling block entities, the knockback doesn't pass through the powder snow. Why is this game like this? Anyway, that completely screws up this design for the smart artillery, because any TNT that stops inside of the powder snow will not transfer any momentum to the falling anvil. The reason why we use powder snow in the first place is because in order to precisely control the position of the TNT, we want it to stop as soon as possible after triggering some mechanism. Without the powder snow, the TNT will continue sliding for some time after we dispense the water to break the water stream. And the problem is, if the TNT is still moving at the point where it explodes, the first TNT to explode will move ahead of the rest of the TNT, accelerating the rest of the TNT backwards, and then what we end up with is this sort of oscillatory behavior where the TNT sort of juggles back and forth, accelerating the rest of the batch, and we get explosions happening all over the place. This would make all sorts of unpredictable behavior come out of the cannon, which would make it very bad for trying to model it and get precise targets. So we have two options. Either we figure out a way to get the powder snow out of the way after it has stopped the TNT, or we simply forego the powder snow entirely. Waiting longer for the TNT to stop moving due to friction would mean that we'll be forced to shave off a few of these options from the timer. Even if we had to shave off 10 items from each timer, that would still leave us with about 300,000 options for firing. So we can probably afford just removing the powder snow entirely and then figuring out how much time we need to shave off to ensure the TNT comes to a full stop under its own friction. So we're just going to set this to 2 TNT, put the timer on what was previously the max setting, and log the explosions. If we then activate the cannon, now the TNT is not going to come to a complete stop, and we can clearly see that in the TNT not exploding in the same spot. We then want to go ahead and bump down this timer until we no longer see the TNT separating. And it turns out that threshold is around 48 items. So if we trigger the cannon, 
the TNT stops moving. And we can see that reflected in all 10 TNT exploding at exactly the same position. If we bump it up to 49 and run it again. Our TNT separates all over the place. So we've gone from what was essentially 59 different configurations of this timer to 47 which has cut us down to about 270,000 firing options. Hopefully that will still be enough to get decent coverage of a target area. The cannon is now rigged to auto fire and cycle through the new settings, so we can log the final position of the TNT without the powdered snow involved. So let's start it up and cycle through and I'll bring you guys back when I have the new data loaded up and ready to test. Quite a while later and I've gone and simulated the trajectory for the cannon without powdered snow. Our cannon is given a fixed position with respect to our battleship game and each setting for the cannon corresponds to one of these lines traced out by the path of the anvil after launch. Using an algorithm we find the trajectory which places the anvil as close as possible to the center of a tile on our battle grid. Then we write these settings to the text files used by Kikuji's mod. Alright, we are only 24 hours out from the start of the Secret Santa event. We have our battleship game fully encased with our cannons installed and the settings for the UCSM mod fine tuned. We are in a bit of a time crunch so it's time to get our building pants on and get to work building this behemoth on the Wavetech server. So let's get busy with it. Now that was an epic grind. A huge thanks to Trolley, Random, JKM and Magic Man for the last minute help with this gargantuan task. I might have bitten off a bit more than I could chew trying to build a fully functional minigame in 24 hours. Though unfortunately the game wasn't fully functional by the time I had to present it. At around 90% complete I had to make my way over to Waytex spawn for the start of the Secret Santa event. Okay, hello everyone, welcome to uh, the Wave Tech Secret Santa events for 2023. Uh, I am so glad that so many uh, members decided to participate this year. Uh, 21 people actually uh, participated this year, so uh, re let's really hope that this year we're going to get as many great gifts as we had uh, last year and maybe less uh, single, uh, single item presents. Um. <laughs> that was JKM, one of the admins and founding members of the Wavetech server. It turns out we had 21 people participate in this year's Secret Santa event. That is an insane amount of presents being thrown around. Don't worry, we won't be covering all of them, but there were a few highlights. Okay, Oriol, crack it open. Really, <laughs> meanwhile, maybe if you go to the year present in survival, then we can link up with you. Wow, it. it is Pretty so looks, good. Looks cool, yeah. So detailed. Yep. So should we guess what is inside the gift based off the shape of the box? A cube. An Xbox. Uh, the, the... <laughs> <laughs> PS5? 
<laughs> yes, PS5, let's go. <laughs> GPU and Vita 50 series? No, 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 no. Igler, Igler, you may be onto something. It's an RTX 4050. It has to be. No, it's a 50 series. can. Toothbrush. Or. You gotta, no. you gotta hit the node block, Oreo. <laughs> Oh. oh yeah, here we go, yeah. frames. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, another slideshow. Wow, <laughs> what is this? And the roof breaks uh, too. Yup. Hold on, I can't see. Oh, oh my God, Jesus! Uh, look at that concrete powder. It is being supported by skulk veins. Wow. <laughs> Just oh, random, like, keep everything. aiming. Yeah. Yeah. Yo, oh, oh, yes. lag. <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, it's a yeah. oh, yes. Oh my god. <laughs> As you can see, we set a pretty high bar for the kinds of presents we distribute on the Wavetech server. This next one for Mr. Max Mondays was absolutely mind blowing. All right, working on it. Go fly around the tree. <laughs> Oh, you made it. I know. <laughs> my laptop. <laughs> I can make it. I'm gonna stay here. The giant sandbox <laughs> in the iron farm. I forgot about that. <laughs> okay. But, okay, but let's yeah, go Mondays. to Max. Mondays. Mr. Max Mondays here. Oh, 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 oh frame. Oh, there's my frame. Frame. <laughs> so much oh, work yeah. went into this. <laughs> Even my RTX 4050 is Frame. struggling right now. Frames. <laughs> oh, dear, it right. had to happen. <laughs> this sand took me so much time, man. It's not... Look at all this fucking it's not, it's not Discord, it's my game. <laughs> what is it? Wait, what is it? What? Parkour. I'm assuming I have... There it's not place. parkour, please, no. <laughs> Yo. Do you have to look at an angle? Holy smokes! Uh, click on Max, by the way. Holy smokes! You should what? click on Max. Oh my Yo. god. Nope. nope, I'm never gonna click Max. That is oh, crazy. That is, that is incredible. Look, Everyone oh entered Max's POV. Yep. What? I feel like Max, can you stand there still? Yep. What? Oh god. <laughs> this is I am crazy. actually I love it. I'm gonna I'm gonna send I'm gonna send a screenshot to random right what? now. Squibble has to be one of the most talented Minecraft engineers I've encountered, and even has a YouTube channel. Be sure to check it out, as I'd imagine there's good things to come from them in the future. Many of the gifts are more technical and demonstrated concepts made to intrigue the recipient. Let's go to the magic present. Yeah. Ah, fuck's sake. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna fly. <laughs> <laughs> there should be. There might be. Oh, there is a dice in here. Cool. Oh. Uh, roll. Okay, I'm gonna roll it, medic. Oh. Three. Ooh. Oh, this was. <laughs> oh. I was Yo. talking about this idea with people. Uh, I forgot who I was talking about it. But it's a dice where you roll it, and all the all the sides are actually correct. And it's random. Then some gifts, like trolleys, were just plain silly. Okay, trolley, you're next. Okay. Map parts, a chest plate, oh. and one D by position for coding uh, with Hunter. Oh, oh, Swedish fish. <laughs> 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 there isn't really a guide to what constitutes a good present, so accentuating a person's features is often a good approach. Right, we have Hunting here. Hunting. Hey guys. Hunting Giga Chad now? Yeah, he's no, always been. been. Yeah. Uh, he's been so Bacon Rick before. <laughs> yeah, he already is up here. That's ages ago. Hunting. No, you're going too far! Where am I going? Yeah, yeah, here. Oh, oh, in the roof. Oh. Yeah. Untune is Giga Chad now. He's going to fuck. A book and a lotion. Load on compass. Ooh. Oh my god. Ooh, that's Record smart actually. No. I completely forgot that the lodestone is a feature. 
Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> All right, I'll read it. Since the dawn of time, humanity has been given consciousness, and with it came truth. Millennia passed, and the knowledge became mundane, lost. Follow the path to the truth and learn who you really are. For the purposes of the build event, the truth is not far away. Also, make sure to have your render distance at 16 or higher. Okay. <laughs> I was like, wait. <laughs> <laughs> On to an IRL? Oh my god. <laughs> you? So good. <laughs> so good. Another interesting approach is to give somebody a unique experience. Okay, okay, okay. Next we go for a monkey. Yeah, go go for it. Open. Another book. Book. <laughs> book. Okay. What, the, what does it say? Give someone to oh. like more sure. or less. Not the recording uh, notes. The real beauty of a gift is in the joy of receiving it. Your present, uh, your present tries to em embodies the magic of the special moment. Hope you like it. Oh, okay, I shit. want to read it for them. <laughs> I can. Bye, Joe. <laughs> if there is anything better than update suppression, it's got got to be the satisfaction of breaking it. Press the not block, take a few steps back, and enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, oh, God. Oh, Why would you move a little oh, bit more back? Oh, 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 oh no. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, that is sick! Oh my god. <laughs> Just for reference, normally when we slice portals, it can take hours of tedious work, and breaking a portal like that has to be a technical player's greatest fear. But Andre just casually sliced a bunch of portals and rigged them to explode in a display catered to Fallen Monkey. What an insane thing to do. But out of all the gifts, my favourite had to be JKM's. It was just so personalized and, well, fun to watch him unravel the mystery. Oh, so here's your gems. For this, this year, this year's a gift for me? No way! Hey, Gem, no you can way. open yours. Okay, it's, yours? it's another book. A <laughs> uh, book. <laughs> okay. What does it say? You're a mean one, Mr. JKM. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I could. You really are a heel. You're as cuddly as a cactus storage. <laughs> You're as charming as a squid farm, Mr. JKM. <laughs> You're a bad banana with a greasy bad <laughs> You're a monster, Mr. JKM. Your heart's void, Perry. <laughs> Your brain is full of spiders. <laughs> You're got, you've got pierogi in your soul, Mr. JKM. <laughs> I wouldn't... <laughs> Is this Secret Santa? I, I guess I've been naughty this year. Uh, I wouldn't touch you with a 39 and a half foot traffic cone. <laughs> Don't tell me it's another traffic cone shop at the Void Perry. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. What? Oh, no. Oh. I yeah, feel like I've so... seen this before. Is this what your passion? Okay, so for a bit of context, uh, oh two gosh. years ago, uh, I was given uh, this bedrock breaking shop uh, on the east side of the uh, void perimeter, uh, but I never really turned it into a shop. Uh, but <laughs> apparently this year, my secret Santa uh, <laughs> finally gave me the shop uh, with very passionate storage, it seems. <laughs> okay, so welcome to JKM Citadel of Solitude. To ensure that only the one and real JKM can enter, please enter the highly sophisticated password that only the real JKM would know. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder. 6969. That would be a really funny way to get my credit card number, not gonna lie. Uh, <laughs> nah, it's, it has to be... It has to be 115, right? 115? There, nah. That, no, it's a combination. And that's one. double numbers, right? It, it needs to be unique ones. Yeah. Is this the size of MNP? Ooh, 51, 5104. 
Hold on. Let me try. <laughs> 5104. Oh, Shit, no. Oh. <laughs> no, okay, okay. Let me try 69 for 20. Uh, okay, so si 69. Oh, just... <laughs> <laughs> man has his sounds off, man. This is a very sophisticated combination lock of just connecting <sighs> to the specific levers that he has to flick. Okay, hold on, hold on. Okay, 69. Still, oh, my it was, guy! It was just... literally just 69. <laughs> wow. I was so blind! I... <laughs> That's why I told you to turn on your sounds. <laughs> Okay, oh, nice. oh, Error, please complete the CAPTCHA. CAPTCHA, select the supreme method of transportation. <laughs> bicycle boat. Bi bicycle, <laughs> bicycle, of course. Bicycle, I mean, we all know. Okay. Yeah. So it has to be bicycle. Okay, it has to be um, bicycle because I love cycling, right? But is yeah. there anything that my secret center would be like, yeah, JKM would definitely would like to uh, slingshot an actual human uh, just to transport them. Okay, I'm gonna select bicycle. Oh, there's... Something there's happens? Another... Oh, <laughs> my god, you blind. look at the floor. <laughs> You're oh. blind. Okay. okay. I, I am blind. Oh, I already no. captured the verification <laughs> thing. <laughs> New capture, please craft the command. Like, oh my god! <laughs> yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Falling block setup. <laughs> I love this. Shit. I love this so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Th this is from the. <laughs> A copper locking system, <laughs> yes! Oh uh, wait, what the hell? <laughs> okay, polish mode. Heck? No, I am not flicking that. <laughs> Jesse, we need to expand the energy. It should say Eagler. <laughs> You're uh, Walter White. Polish mode. Oh, the polish mode just... Okay, yeah, because we steal. I get it, I get it. <laughs> 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 so, what about my present to Zoid? Well, after the event, a bunch of us got to work, finishing off the Battleship game, and then me and Zoid did the very first playtest of the game on the server, where everything went smoothly. Sort of. There were some slight issues with hit markers not registering on the opponent's board, as well as anvils landing in weird ways which prevented them from being collected. Some anvils even missed their tiles completely. But despite these issues, Zord and I still managed to have a thrilling game where by the end of it, we were neck and neck with nothing but our destroyers left on the board. I managed to score a lucky hit on Zord's destroyer and it was all downhill from there, as Zord had tried every location except the bottom corner where my destroyer was hiding. Fortunately, the problems were quite easy to understand. The problem with the hit markers not working was caused by the bubble columns which were built with fully formed bubble columns as well as the dispenser having a water bucket. So when a column first triggered, the dispenser would dispense the water into the fully formed column and the signal would be completely lost. However, subsequent signals would use the bucket to pick up the water and thus flip the state of the column. So the simple solution to this was to go through and trigger all the bubble columns twice to ensure that they were ready to send signals. As for the problem with the accuracy of the anvils, I neglected to consider that there could be holes in the point cloud large enough to fit entire tiles. Here you can see the entire plane of points that the anvil artillery can hit, contrasted with these blue squares which represent the grid. Notice how the density of points varies enormously over the grid. This is because I overtuned the cannon too aggressively, meaning most of the firing options occur at extremely long ranges that were not useful for our battleship game. To solve this issue, I purposely detuned the cannon, giving the anvil a much higher initial position, meaning that it's much further from the TNT initially, but also the angle from the anvil to the TNT is much higher. This results in the firing options being dragged back towards the cannon, giving us the highest density of firing options on the grid. Which means we can now guarantee that there is an optimal firing option for every tile. So with this modification to the cannon, we can now guarantee that every single anvil will at least land within the 3x3 area of each tile.
So, how do you actually play the game? Well, first of all, you want to grab yourself the latest version of Kiku G's unnamed Canon setup mod. Be sure to install the mod into your mods folder. And also, you want to go to your config folder, create a file called UCSM. And in this folder, you want to create another folder called Battleship, which will store the text files which will contain the firing settings for the cannon. The downloads for these will be linked down in the description. To then set up the game, you want to make sure that this lever is on for your grid. And this means that the grid is in assignment mode. So what you can do is grab some items like so. And then you can go through and if you chuck the items into a tile and they get collected, the tile will then flip states. And that indicates that this tile is now a component of a ship. So you want to go through and keep doing this to tiles to define the various ships. Like for example, five tiles is an aircraft carrier. Then you have three tiles, which represents either a submarine or a frigate. And you keep doing this until you have defined the positions of your entire fleet. Once all your ships are in position, you can then go ahead and click this lever off and now any items that go into these squares will activate that tile and if a part of a ship is hit this will show up on your opponent's board however if something is amiss it will show up as white to start using the cannon you'll want to run the command slash ucsm load and then use the folder called battleship which contains the fire settings for our cannon and now those settings have been loaded into your minecraft client so you can just run the command slash ucsm target and then you can type in the grid name from the board so for example if we want to hit that aircraft carrier we can try and hit b6 this will give us the configuration to hit that tile on our opponent's board, which is 417540. So we want to put 41 items into this hopper timer. The next number is 7, so that is a count of 7 on this lectern. Then we have 5 on this lectern. And finally, 40 items in this timer. Be extremely careful when playing with these timers that you do not ever Put the item count above 48. For example, if you accidentally put an extra item in here and the count is 49, well, as I demonstrated earlier on in the video, the TNT will start to oscillate and that could result in the cannon exploding. So always make sure to keep this item count at 48 or below. Also be careful that you never accidentally remove all the items, like so, because that will activate the timer which will trigger a mechanism which if you look down here has now flipped the state of this water stream and this will cause the cannon to not fire accurately to ensure that you never do this accidentally what I suggest doing is removing half of a stack popping a single item like so and now you can remove all but one item without accidentally tripping the timer once the settings are loaded in we can hit this note block to arm the cannon and it will fire there goes the anvil and it should come crashing down on the grid B6. There it is, we just scored a hit. As the cannon fires, it will also deplete these anvil magazines, so make sure that you stay on top of them by placing the anvils down again. Then of course, you keep on going until all of somebody's ships are sunk. Just keep in mind, if you have one and you have some of your ships remaining, you want to make sure you go through and manually reset the tiles by sinking your ships by throwing items in like so. This will make sure that the tiles are all reset because unfortunately I don't have any way to do this automatically. Alright, that's enough about Battleship because I've got a present myself. And my Secret Santa present is an escape room made by Oreo Kublis. Here we go, I blurred up the resource pack. And just for good measure, I'm going to go ahead and unbind my left mouse button. And that means we should be ready... Oh, 
Yeah, maybe I should wait until I'm actually in the game before doing that. Oh my. Certainly knows how to make an interior. <laughs> okay, after looting the chest, I have a book which can give me hints if I'm having a skill issue. And from what I can tell, I am looking for papers with symbols that I need to translate into passwords that will create keys that let me progress into the next room. So immediately I can see our first victim. Might be able to make that jump. <laughs> Kiki bugger. Hmm, that's very suspect. Must be our first symbol, right? Ah, oh, seven must be the digits. Ah, that's the that's A. Ah, that's how you're supposed to make the jump, I guess. Oh, hello. Easter egg. Oh, come on. <laughs> Already tried that. I don't know how many nerve blocks I hit if I can't make this jump. Christ, that took forever. Alright, we got position 5, whatever the heck that symbol is. I think that is a P. Yep, it has to be P. So, positions 1 and 6 is the circle symbol. Is E. 2 and 7 are that symbol. Is A. 3 and 8 is the little shear symbol. S. And 4 and 9 is the little beetle. Is 5. Of course, we have P, which is up there, so. Should be it. How is that not it? Yeah, and then that's five. That's that's the five notes. All the letters. Why aren't you opening? I'm just gonna break it. Dictionary. E. A. S. That is Y. A S Y. Then just E. Right? I think this is the right key. Yeah, I'm just gonna have to break through the wall. Wait, what am I doing? I have a pickaxe in here. Alright, hopefully we don't need to do that again. I'll just leave that there for a keep. Alright, where are we now? <laughs> oh god. Okay, th this doesn't look very YouTube friendly. Alright, what is this about? I mean, which alkali metal? There's several. What is it? You got cadmium, indium, gallium. Well, it's cadmium, right? Oh, right. I throw it in front of the chest. Uh, am I just gonna have to try all the alkali metals until I get one that happens to be in a, a computer? I guess lithium is also an option. Uh, I guess I like that one. Oh, somehow I should be able to get white dye apparently. Hmm. I wonder. 
I wonder what item I could possibly use to make white dye that might happen to be in my hotbar in the first slot that my hand is currently holding. Oh look! Ta-da! Hopefully I spelled that right. God, I hate doing math with words. Much prefer using equations. Or even just using MATLAB. Uh, essentially, these words translated into equations looks like this. That X, Y, and Z are effectively the digits of the combination. So we've got the sum of our digits equals to 21, three times one of the digits equals two times another digit, and then the remaining digit is equal to three less than n's digit. So what we have here is a linear system of equations, which we can actually solve. And bish bash bosh, we can just define the matrix notation and apply the linear transformation, and we get the combination 885. Let's go 885. There we go. Ah, thank you. Huh. Fun fact, if you put garbage into an algorithm, you get garbage out. So let's try that again with the correct coefficients. There we go. 6, 9, 6. Here we go. 6, 9, 6. Happen? Okay, it's definitely eaten that item. No, so did I put the correct combination in? There's the second ingredient. From what I can tell, this is a transparent material that is buoyant, but also sort of soluble. Ah, I think I know what it is. Ice, ice, baby. So I guess. I guess it consumed it. Alright, is it anything? Piece in my paper for the other two ingredients, but not giving me anything. Missing something? Okay, so I'm assuming that when I ate the paper, it was supposed to give me one of these, right? I mean, the second green is in there, right? Must be. Hang on, I must have answered this right. Yeah, it was ice. Alright, I know what to do. The pickaxe beats all escape rooms. There we go. Final ingredient acquired. There we go. Oh. What's going on? Hey, what? How? Why is it? This was the chemical abbreviation one, the first ingredient. Are they not in order? I think it's now the fourth one. What? But this is that's the first one. I claim metal. Yeah, that's lithium. I guess it's crazy. There we go. <laughs> All right, and after two hours, the escape room is finally done. It was kind of broken, but I assume that was simply an issue of influencing the design and survival. I'd imagine this was made in creative and playtested extensively. However, when it was made in survival, because it was single use, there was no way to playtest it again. A huge thanks to Oreo for such an intriguing gift. I had fun solving the puzzles. And with that, I think we've reached the end of the video. A huge thanks to the members of the Wavetix server for making such a fun community. As for me, I now have pieces of paper qualifying me as an engineer. Which means my next step is to ascend into some higher purpose, I guess? Look, at some point, we ought to start using our creativity and ingenuity to solve real world problems. After all, somebody has to keep the lights on and the water flowing. 
but I will still be around, working on projects with the WaveFix server, and tinkering with ideas in Minecraft. So a Merry Christmas to you all, and see you again next year.